How does one talk about Bubba Hotep? It's a story of fallen kings, about the fragility of legacy and the stories that are lost to those that are discarded away in the corners of society. More importantly, it's about Elvis Presley's ancient geriatric penis. Elvis dreamed he had his dick out, checking to see if the bump on the head of it had filled with pus again. If it had, he was going to name the bump Priscilla after his ex-wife and bust it by d***ing off. Hi, I'm C.B. Smith, and that is one way to start your book out, that's for sure. Joe R. Lansdale grew up in East Texas in the 1950s, and East Texas is what this man writes. Not just in settings, but in writing styles. In an interview with NPR, Lansdale recalls where in school he read a story in a play that he wrote. While the class liked it, the teacher gave him a B for using, quote, colloquial language, i.e., he wrote how he spoke. This doesn't mean that Lansdale has only written stories about East Texas with only Texas Twain dialogue. His writings over the years have spanned sci-fi, horror, westerns, comics, including scripts for what many consider one of the best Batman the Animated Series episodes, and one of the worst as well. Thought this might be a good place to keep you, at least till the silo takes off. Takes off? It's actually a rocket bat, folks. I actually like this episode. I wish Farmer Brown was in more stuff. It's a shame he hasn't shown up in the comics. That's a lot of bull. Bubba Hotep was a short story that started as a joke between Lansdale and a friend about the idea of a mummy down in the south. The story started to take form, much like the mummy in the story, when Lansdale was in a nursing home looking after his mom. When he was offered to write for a short story collection, The King is Dead, Tales of Elvis Postmortem in 1994, the movie begins, much like the book does, with an elderly Elvis Presley not dead from a drug overdose in 1977, but actually switched places with an Elvis impersonator some time before due to being disingenuous with the life he had. No real friends, one day after another, stuck in an endless loop of bad movies, Vegas shows, and no creative challenges or outputs. Here I was complaining about a loss of pride and how life had treated me, and now I realize I never had any pride. Or was he? We're never told explicitly if this is the real Elvis Presley or an impersonator that has led himself to believe he was the real Elvis. I like to take him at his word, but the fact is that it can go either way, and the movie and book never tell us it. Now Elvis is in a nursing home in East Texas. No real friends, one day after another, stuck in an endless loop of bad movies and shows with no creative challenges or outputs. It's a bleak end for the king of rock and roll. Even more so in the book, where it's mentioned he wakes up every morning, soiling himself, not out of a disability, he just stopped caring. And did I mention his penis? The old Dillabopper was no longer a flesh cannon loaded for bear ass. It was a peanut, too small to harvest, wasting away on the vine. You see, Elvis's penis is a representation of his manhood. No, that's just his penis. I mean, his inability to get an erection is a representation of his life becoming flaccid. And is this my life now? Making penis puns on the internet? Now I realize I never had any pride. Early on in the story, Elvis's roommate Bull dies in bed. The book mentions him serving in Vietnam, but since the actor Harrison Young also played elderly Ryan from Saving Private Ryan, I'm guessing they moved him to World War II. Also, does this make Bubba Hotep and Saving Private Ryan take place in the same universe? Probably not, but I like to think so. In both versions, Elvis wakes up to see Bull's daughter Callie going through Bull's things, finding money, throwing out pictures of Bull and his purple heart. Elvis asks if he could have them to remember Bull by, in which she bends down to pick them up, where Elvis can see up her skirt. She saw me as so physically and sexually non-threatening, she didn't mind if I got a bird's eye view of her love nest. And as we all know, boys, the worst thing you could be for a woman is to be sexually non-threatening. Wait a minute. Yeah, interesting choice of words, but it's to show the downfall to the king of rock and roll. Someone that was looked and worshipped as the epitome of cool at a time, and even still do with his net worth in 2020 being worth more than when he died in 1977. He had crowds of girls, and women, but also girls, we'll get back to that, fawning over him. Now he's looked on as the same as a house cat. Much like how we don't know if this is the real Elvis, we don't know Callie's backstory. Elvis asks why she never came to visit Bull after dropping him off, and she gets defensive. Talks about how she couldn't take care of him. And if it hadn't been for Medicaid, Medicare, you know, whatever that stuff was, he'd have been in a ditch somewhere. If it hadn't been for Medicaid or Medicare, whatever that stuff was, he'd have been in some ditch somewhere. 
You could have come and seen him. They don't charge you for that. Mind your own business. It's not the best excuse to not see him, but there's a story we may not be seeing in this exchange. The book mentions how Bull is a nickname for his bullishness when he was younger, probably thought he'd live forever and happily, boozing, pill popping, swinging his dick until the end of time. No mention on how he was as a dad though. Sometimes old people are awful. The book has other characters living in their retirement home, but only the movie introduces this woman that goes around stealing things from the other residents, including glasses from a woman in an iron lung. She doesn't even need them, she just takes them, and that's just mean. So when the mummy comes for her, we don't feel all that bad. This is a good addition, varying from the book. The residents in the book are all people who believe they are someone else, including Mum's Delay, an elderly woman who believes that she is the famed gangster John Dillinger, forced to undergo a sex change operation. Switching Dillinger with this woman in the movie is a smart move, otherwise this retirement home would be a bit of a stereotype and simply be an insane asylum for elderly people suffering from mental illness. Or a nursing home with the weirdest luck of having famous residents that can't prove they are who they say they are. But even with that, the best character in the story by far is Jack President John F. Kennedy. No offense, but President Kennedy was a white man. That's how clever they are. They dyed me this color. Like Elvis Presley, JFK is another public figure that's iconic whose life is shrouded in myth and legend, with JFK almost literally. When shortly after his assassination in 1963, his widow and former first lady, Jacqueline Kennedy, referred to his legacy as an American Camelot, alluding to the legend of King Arthur. Much like the king of rock and roll, the legacy of old Jackie O surpassed him in life with what we generally remember his accomplishments are things that happened after his death, signed into law in part in his memory. Kennedy is listed by historians to be around the 8th to 10th of the most impactful presidents in American history, mostly through him being in office for only three years, and most of his proposals, like proposals of most presidents, died in Congress. But after his death, you have a shift in focus to both his dirty details and affairs come to light or books asking about the assassination, not the man who was assassinated. There's one anecdotal story I remember reading but can't find anywhere to verify if true, was that Kennedy once asked an advisor while visiting the Lincoln Memorial if Lincoln would have been remembered if he also wasn't assassinated so horrifically or publicly. The advisor said no. And again, like Elvis, it's never specified whether in book or movie if he really is JFK who survived the assassination, skin died, his brain replaced with a bag of sand, but my god do they keep it up through the whole story. Marilyn Monroe? What's she like in a sack? That is classified information, top secret. But between you and me, wow! Elvis finding Jack on the floor is what starts their investigation into the mummy. We learn through them that the mummy is sucking the souls of the old folks through any hole of their body. Any hole. A shit eater? And he poops the digested souls when he's done down the toilet, which is not only an incredibly dark and gross aspect to the story, it's also a callback to the beginning when Elvis is pondering about what lies ahead with this metaphor that could only come from someone like Joe Lansdale. When he's evacuated from the bowels of life into the toilet bowl of the beyond and flushed, would the great sewer pipe flow him to the other side where God would, in the guise of a great all-seeing turd with curled kernel eyes, be waiting with open turd arms and would there be amongst the sewage his mother and father and friends? Well, that's one way to describe the passage of life, that's for sure. The end of Bubba Hotep has an elderly Elvis Presley with an infected growth on his penis and an elderly black JFK fighting a mummy in cowboy boots in a retirement home in East Texas. This story has no right to be as good as it is, and yet, it all works. All three of these characters are some kind of royalty from a long ago era. The King of Rock and Roll, America's Camelot, and King Tut. I no, I'm more like King Tut's brother. Are shriveled husks of their former selves. And speaking of shriveled husks of your former selves, uh, I'm doing it again, aren't I? Now I realize I never had any pride. The growth on Elvis's penis becomes a central part of his character development. There's a nurse character who's described in the book as the good looking one with the smooth chocolate skin and f***s like grapefruits. Oh, Joe. The nurse administers a cream on Elvis's um, growth to lower the swelling, but as the story progresses and Elvis gets motivated by the mummy, something outside the same routine in the retirement home, he tries to establish some independence, only to be looked down on by the nurse as if he's a child. Elvis is not having it. 
You treat me like a baby again, I'll wrap this goddamn walker right around your head. Ha! <laughs> Who's sexually non-threatening now? Wait a minute. Much like Callie, we don't know much about the nurse character. She doesn't even get a name in the credits or in the book. She's just the nurse. But we do get one small scene in the movie where she notices something wrong in a tool shed in relation to the mummy. She tries to tell the administrator only to then be made to give an enema to a resident as she's trying to finish her cigarette and to not ask questions, alluding to maybe the administrator knows something about old Bubba Hotep. Also letting us in on the story, she's not too happy in her position, and why not? She's been having to apply ointment to an old man's junk and give old lady enemas. With Elvis and JFK, you have a kind of fictional redemption for their past lives. Elvis watches old movies of himself, technically movies with Elvis lookalikes, since the movie's budget couldn't afford to use licensed Elvis material. He looks on at his life with condemnation to motivate himself to stand up save his nursing home from this evil, soul-sucking mummy. Time to be a little of what I'd always fantasized being. A hero. A story like Bubba Hotep gives the chance to examine on the life of legacy of JFK and Elvis for the characters themselves to reflect on their own lives and past mistakes. We weren't there for our kids when they needed us, were we? It doesn't go very far. Or at least because it's juggling such a silly premise while also being a bit of a celebration of Elvis. Never f with the king. The focus is kind of off, but it is there. Elvis reflects on the treatment he gave to his ex-wife Priscilla, mentioning cheating on her, doing lots of drugs and partying, being a neglectful dad, and wishing he fired his manager Colonel Parker a long time ago. This is a sentiment among other works about Elvis's darker side. Disgraceland by Jake Brennan, a book blending real musicians with their past crimes, is a kind of pseudo-narrative. It has an alternate history Elvis talking to himself right before his death about Colonel Parker, how he's a terrible influence on him and possible murderer. And this is all true, people influence other people, but Elvis was an adult, and the things he's done can't all be blamed on Parker or his unfortunate pill addiction. Right, so remember when I said earlier that Elvis had like a lot of girls fawning over him during his career? Well... Hi, me from the editing room. So listen, this was supposed to be my fun episode, but in writing and researching, I fell down a bit of a rabbit hole. So trigger warning, the next couple minutes will be talks of physical, sexual, and mental abuse of both kids and adults, and recent events concerning COVID-19 health policies. So skip to this point here if you don't want to hear it. I would not blame you. All right, uh, back to the show. When Elvis was 24 and stationed in Germany during his time drafted into the army, he met 14-year-old Priscilla at one of his parties. They hit it off, starting to see each other more often. When he came back to the States, they exchanged love letters, much to the dismay of Elvis's of-age girlfriend, Anita Wood. Elvis brought Priscilla over to the States. She had her own place at 16 years old to go to school, but in her own words, pretty much lived with Elvis at the time. Right, so most of what I could find was from Priscilla's own memoir from 1986. There's been other works written about Elvis's relationship with uh, underage girls. Child Bride by Suzanne Finstead is another one that's been praised for its research, but I'd rather go on Priscilla's own words. Elvis and Me, written by Priscilla, is written about Elvis in a fairly light matter, where she looks back on her experience with a sort of fondness at some times, as a fan turned wife. When a celebrity starts to be romantically involved with a fan, even if they are of age, which is not this case, need to make that clear, there is an off balance of power and influence there. What she describes in the book would be considered textbook examples of child molestation, sexual grooming, emotional and psychological abuse, among others. This isn't me mansplaining to Priscilla Presley, saying, oh no, sweetie, you actually are a victim of abuse, but don't realize it. In a 2016 interview, she explained she still loved him. And that can be true. I wouldn't take that away. I believe it. Sometimes we love our abusers in a way that we tend to soften up our experiences with them after they pass. It was a different time, quite literally. Priscilla divorced from Elvis in 1973, after six years of being married. 73 is 20 years before the Violence Against Women's Act, almost 7 years before the modern definition for domestic violence was recognized. Domestic violence before the Violence Against Women's Act was more of a civil case than a criminal one during this time period. We literally did not see these things in 1973 as we do now, in more ways than one. 
So while still being a teenage girl, her and Elvis did not have sex. Elvis taught her how to, quote, please him in other ways, according to her. She doesn't go into detail, and I don't want her to. What we would describe as sexual grooming wasn't a fully recognized term until around 2004, but similar terms were recognized in the late 1970s, after the divorce when Priscilla was an adult. During their time together, Elvis gave her pills so she can keep up with his lifestyle. He forced her to dress and act certain ways, and she, as a teenage fan turned adult wife growing up in that environment, wanted to please him. She describes this time in her life as, quote, Elvis's living doll, and she was his, quote, lived-in Lolita. That is a whole other can of worms to unpack about attitudes on Vladimir Nabokov's book, Today versus in the 70s. Listen, I just turned Bubba f***ing Hotep into a downer of an episode. Lolita would just be... <sighs> While Elvis constantly cheated on Priscilla, she felt compelled to confide in him about her affair with an instructor. It was then that Elvis, again in her words, forcefully made love to her. And he allegedly planned to hire a hitman to murder the instructor. According to Priscilla, her relationship with Elvis got a whole lot better after the divorce. She had her own agency again, and she got to be herself generally for the first time in a long time. Accounts from Elvis's girlfriends, both of age and not, after the divorce, shows a man more and more erratic and violent, shooting guns off over their heads while they're in bed, among other things. My point being, after all of that, is that Elvis has been dead for over 40 years. We can look on at their work and their lives through a myriad of different lenses. This is one of them. Baba Hotep is another. You can still listen to the music. You can still watch the movies. He's the king of rock and roll, after all. He's just more like King Joffrey to me. Even without this info about the king added into the story, Bubba Hotep is a bleak story. Underneath all the penises and mummy soul sucking, Elvis and Jack realize that the mummy is in a good position. Their retirement home, how retirement homes are set up historically, have their starts in almhouses, poor houses. Church groups started setting up retirement homes to get away from the poor houses in the late 1800s, if you could afford it and if you belong to that specific religion or race. Most still lived in almhouses or asylums and institutions, though. By the 1930s, only about 15% of people living in poor houses were classified as physically able to work poor. The rest were sick or the elderly. Bringing in Medicaid or Medicare, whatever that stuff was, brought on an entire retirement home industry for those that needed it, that today is still mostly funded by those programs. Still, as Arizona State Senator David Pryor said on the floor in 1970 about the state of retirement homes at the time, which were a lot worse than they are now, they were, quote, halfway houses between society and the cemetery. Retirement homes are filled with people dying of disease, or age, or disease, or accidents, or disease, because many are small places, with overworked or small staff going from resident to resident, and if the patient is sick or in a hospital, but isn't healed all the way of their Bubba Hotep, they come back to their home, back to that environment, allowing Bubba Hotep to spread with little hope of controlling it. But, you know, only about 6% of all elderly people live in retirement homes, plus like, the survivability of Bubba Hotep is like more than 99% I heard once from a friend's uncle on social media, so... That's what they brought us here for to get us out of the way until we die. And those who don't die first from disease or just plain being old, he gets. If grandma right. dies in a nursing home at age 81, that's tragic and it's terrible. Also, the life expectancy in the United States is 80. So here's Joe Lansdale and director John Cassarelli taking a very bleak world that we know exists but don't much talk about. How do you make a story about that without getting to the end and you don't want to just sit there in the dark staring at the wall? What do I care? I got a growth in my picker. You make a dark comedy. You have an author who's crass, but whom can take an uncomfortable subject matter and dilute it enough so we can consume it through catharsis. That is the legacy of Bubba Hotep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Life sure it's fleet, you know? What? Life, I'm saying it's fleet, you know what I mean? One minute you're here and the next minute you're gone! This is C.B. Smith and thanks for taking a page. 
Hi everyone, thank you so much for sticking around. Like you, I didn't expect this to go the way it did. But if you enjoyed this video, I have plenty more, and if you like them enough, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to help support me financially, as I'm looking to update some equipment, you can sign up for my Patreon account, where you'll have early access to these videos, and ability to partake in book readings and discussions. We're going to be starting with Stephen King's banned 1977 novel, Rage, relatively soon. I'm also doing book giveaways. Information about that is in the link below. I hope everyone stays safe, and as always, take care.